So we now have such a finger. Everybody maybe should stick to 20 minutes, if that's possible at all. Yeah? Because then we have Julia Vladova um, and as well. Robert Emmer is cancelled, as you know. And then we have this other page, and there's Yannick. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Camelia. Yeah. And Sylvia. Yeah, right. Okay. Camelia and Sylvia. No, no. Camelia yeah. and Sylvia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Good. Um, now, I, I would suggest um, we try to stick to, to the rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we, we should aim at starting with Yannick at something at, at around 5.30. And then we'll have another two people, that is Camelia and um, uh, Celia. Yeah. Right. No. Yes. No, no, we have Yannick and Camelia. And then Celia will be tomorrow, if that's possible. And then we have six people for each um, track. Um, if, if I, I think it was meant to be flexible, so that this panel would go on tomorrow. It would, wasn't very clear whether it would be today or tomorrow. Uh, I don't know. Jan, can you help us, or what, what do you think? So the, the idea was that until 5.30 you have this panel, but uh, you should be changing your time. You, you, you and at 5.20, uh, yeah, you should start with the next panel. Yeah. Right. And this, this panel would, would go, we have the first person people tonight. Yeah. And the rest. Yeah. So yeah. the, the yeah. two people will be tomorrow. Okay. So to change. Since I will present everything that they are having Oh, that's really fine. Sure. Of course, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. I think. We've kind of sorted it out now, and um, um, we've just, uh, I mean, it would be great, of course, to have a very short break, but uh, let's see. Nine. It will start at 9. Um, you may have seen here the second panel at 9.25, but that's not correct, because it will start at 9 according to the previous page, right? So, so tomorrow what? 9 o'clock. Everything starts at 9 tomorrow morning. Huh. And we will end very soon, I suppose. It won't end before 12.20, I guess. Maybe 12.30. No, no, everything. Um, yeah, everything. But we still need the time, so um, it's good that we could resettle um, the papers and everything. So, yeah. Okay, <laughs> but now it's really up to Sasha Finger. And uh, I just uh, remind you of the title, The Prismatic Role of Media in the Construction of Space as an Identity Marker. Hungarian sex workers in Switzerland. Wow, what an interesting topic. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for coming. It's also kind of a fortunate and very smooth transition from the previous topic to this topic, since I am a geographer and I deal with the construction of spaces and the media <clears throat> and the body, they play a role in it. So we might find one or the other part we had just before the discussion, again in my presentation. Um, I will start with a short background of the Hungarian sex workers in Switzerland, so right in there, and <clears throat> how I came to the topic of my PhD. Then I will um, talk quickly about the methodology I used, and will then give you kind of a short introduction to the discourse analysis of human geographers, so why we use it and how we use it. And then I will only focus on the, let's say, the prismatic roles I will talk about the image produced by the media and yeah I will also talk about the impacts these, these images have <coughs> um, have produced and eventually I will come to the conclusion. So I have chosen the idea of prismatic because if we split like the light we don't see or we see the light uh, invisible light um, into its natural parts that we see different kind of colors and kind of the media has the same idea for me sometimes so we see different kind of truths or we didn't see different parts of truths or we're not really truths or whatever but we never see the whole picture so and me as a researcher I try to understand the entire picture of course, but I'm also just an individual and very subjective so coming to the background there was a lot of 
<coughs> media reporting in 2009 and 10 about Hungarian prosecutors in Syria. So it all started when in 2008 there were zero registrations on the legal patch patches in the prostitution district where men or women can prostitute themselves legally on the streets. So and there was no registration in 2008 up to several hundred, I think even more than, than 400 um, registrations per week in 2010, 2011, only by Hungarian um, women. So the media asked, and I asked myself, of course, who are these women, and why do they come from Hungary, and where from Hungary, and again, why do they go to Switzerland, and why just Zurich, and are there other people involved, are there collaborators, um, how is there maybe a network? Is it, is it kind of a, a pattern we can figure out? And are we talking about um, human trafficking or not? Are we talking about victims or independent working people or not? So all these questions were asked by the media and they never really had a clear answer about it. So I started to conceptualize and also analyze the deal. First information I got was only from the media. So I figured out three components, which I thought are very interesting. And one is the constitution of prostitution places. So how does that work? And also looking at gender studies, who, how can body and gender reproduce or produce space? Of course, the focus in Hungary and Switzerland, and which is the role of the media. The second component, I was looking into this coping mechanism since my take is now before the end, but I'm telling you that most most um, sex workers I have interviewed um, were not traffic victims and more or less independent working women, so they understood the mobility and of course the, the prostitution as a coping mechanism. But for me, it wasn't clear, is that an entire strategy? Is it part of the strategy and how this whole thing is, is, is evolving? And the last part is the mobility patterns. So which affects the mobility and how are these, if, if there are patterns, how do they look like? And what you see on the bottom is basically my, my, my PhD topic now. Um, the Hungarian Romja, Romja is the, the, the female word in Romanes. For, for women, so Hungarian Roman sex workers in Zurich, prostitution in public spaces and transnational mobility as coping mechanisms, and then they cope with what? They cope basically with the socioeconomic exclusion and marginalization in Hungary. Of course, once they worked in Zurich on the patch, they had to cope with many more problems, but this is not the part right now. So I was using the mix of methods, um, starting with action research because it kind of combines the participant observation or it, it, I, I never really use the word interviews so like I don't like using it since I had rather talks with these with these women so they can ask questions and they even influence strongly my research interest and my research questions so it was kind of a I hope an equal interview situation. But I also interviewed or had talks with um, with the husbands and the police, the social workers, the city representatives. Um, yeah, so also with kids and youngsters and with the neighbors of the people. And I, I also went to the so-called um, gypsy ghettos in, in Hungary. And yeah, so I was also using kind of more decided approach. Um, on which I will just show you that immediately, and of course this course analyzes mainly looking at the media because that was kind of the initial thing. Um, due to the media, this topic became yeah important for the society in, in Switzerland, especially in Zurich, as you will see later. <laughs> and of course, I was analyzing historical texts and maps, which is very important if you talk about the change of space change of, of settlements or, or districts and cities. 
So with um, multi-sided research, I do not only mean um, following the people and going just to, to the cities where they live or where they, where they come from or where they work. It's also a, achieving a different perspective. Like once I was a researcher, once I was recognized as a social worker, which I am not, but I was recognized as such. Once I was recognized as a friend of a social worker. And so I had also different perspectives. And I also became a friend sometimes for some of the sex workers. So it, it was very difficult. But again, I also visited um, other places where I did not conduct any interviews or didn't talk to anyone. But um, it was interesting just just to walk through, through those streets and cities and to listen to, to Hungarian sex workers, for example, in Amsterdam, Berlin, or Geneva. So I come to my point of this course analysis in the geography. And so we as geographers, we do not understand space as an empty, simple container with three dimensions. Um, also, in the discourse theoretical approach, um, we would also connect the social element is like adding a fourth dimension, which means that space is, is not just a given thing, but it's reproduced, and that space with its constitution is a very important part of the production of the social reality. That means that space or places are not just expressions of the social structures, but they produce social structures. So it's vice versa. And it's, and it's very important. And taking now the media into, this, into that game is that, for example, media or political expressions such as the axis of evil or war and terror, root nations or the slum, the ghetto, the poor neighborhood, that they have, of course, also, as Volva and Schuba in their articles state that they have a huge influence on the self perception and on the perception of others and their places. So, in human geography, we would not we would not consider space only as a three D container, but also as networks, identity, characters, and stigma. Um, from a structuralistic perspective, um, they, they divide in three, in three levels, simple, micro, means and macro, which means that, for example, researchers in queer studies or gender studies, they focus on the body. This is the micro level. So the perception of the body and how this perception has influenced on the space occupants. I don't know if that's a good translation. I translated it by myself, but by space occupants, we mean like how we use space. It's not that we mean illegal occupation, but like how we as humans use spaces. So we make this a university because we are researchers, students, and professors. And, stuff. and we have the symbols of the books and the boards and the leaders. And of course, yeah, uh, gender studies, they focus on sex and they just differentiate between sex and gender and their power relations. That's the that, 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 is, that is so important, the connection to the power relation. On the meso level, um, researchers in discourse analysis, they, they look at the dominance of economic discourses. Um, that is, for example, uh, privatization of public spaces and how this in increases or causes social inequality because certain groups of the society like poor people, beggars and so on, they will be pushed out of downtown on the central business districts and so on. So this is what they look on. And on the macro level, for example, one can look at the influences of colonialism on social structures, traditions, or linguistic conventions or think patterns. Um, I have a simple example for that is that for in the southern part of, of Africa, especially in South Africa, where the apartheid was the apartheid regime was very very strong and very um, dominated, that 
that people would call, like black people would call other black people a coconut if that means that the black person is outside black and inside white. And that means, yeah, you look black, but you behave like a white. So this is definitely something coming from colonialism in the post-colonialism time and which which still exists today and it's so so dominant there and it also influences spaces because there are neighborhoods where just coconuts live and, and spaces where just the real black ones live or whatever they call themselves. Just as an example. So coming to the image created by the media, I will first talk quickly about Roma in general in Switzerland. I have given you here couple of examples how Swiss media deals with <laughs> deals with the uh, Roma. And I highlight this one because it's the hardest one I've ever seen. Roma coming right in Switzerland, family plans of crime. And this was the title, the that picture. That picture was taken two or three years before the article was written in Kosovo. It is a gypsy uh, boy, but it's a water pistol. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with the, with the article. The photographer sold the, the, the picture to the bad author, and that's it. So there's others like Roma and the migration of poverty, and then like they, um, which were also interesting. Roma women on the patch, and they stand on each other's feet, and um, yeah. Yeah, they buy kids and they exploit them. What is also interesting, it's 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 a word by word translation, but I, I wanted the word by word translation to prove a victim that it is a victim. Kind of convincing the victim that it is a victim. That was in regards to the sex workers. There was a case where a sex worker was caught by the police and the police insisted that she has uh, yeah, that she has been trafficked. But it was never clear if she was or not. Um, so this is kind of the picture they, they produce, and then looking at the word of Roma, it means human, and looking from my perspective of my research that prostitution, migration, or begging can be a form of uh, coping strategy, can be a form of surviving, we can read this completely different. So we can say, humans come, they travel to survive, human women work on the patch until they stand on each other's feet, humans from southeast. So it gives you a different idea of what, what media can make out of yeah, what, what they see and what, what they find interesting to sell. Now coming to the, to, the, to the patch, this is the former red light, the former red light district of, of Zurich. These pictures I have taken here today. Um, yeah, you see people walking there, it's super clean. Um, People live in a living, living house, it's uh, pretty normal. The media only showed those pictures. I don't want to be racist, but um, uh, sexist. Uh, <laughs> and also to prove that I have not um, chosen those pictures because I like women or something, is, um, we do a small, big experiment. Sorry. So what we can put in only the uh, the name you see of the red light district, the former red light district, and you will see the same pictures. So this is what. Even the virtual place is one-sided. Um, so coming back to my presentation. Yeah. The, due to the huge amount of sex workers from Hungary and the importance in the media, the red light district has been shifted from this place to this place. 
and it, they have been produced new drive-in sex boxes right next to the um, immigration detention center, which is, <laughs> you see, it's made of containers. Um, so you see the, the new red light district is now in the suburbs, only accessible by, by cars, for example. And yeah, what are those sex boxes? I mean, what can we think of? Oh, what is a sex box? <laughs> so because it's really cold like this, so a sex box is basically, as you can see on the right hand side, um, it's a parking spot where the driver cannot open the door anymore, but the woman can come in. And the entire area is, is a one-way road. So you enter the area, you pick the woman of your choice, then she comes with you to the sex box, she comes into the car, you cannot enter as a man, uh, exit as a man. And yeah, there's also some nice signals to make things clear where to go. So you have 18 plus, you cannot come with your bicycle. Uh, so you can come with the camper van, but you cannot be two guys at once. So also, the women have to, as a sex worker, you have to take a ticket, it's five francs, five euros these days. So to work there for one day. Um, but that has some influences in a positive way and in a negative way. So the positive way is there are safety buttons, there's vending machines, there is a shower and toilet facilities, um, there's a room where they can just warm up themselves and where men cannot enter. And women cannot anymore be kidnapped. That was a big issue from, from the former um, uh, red light district. Um, yeah, so it's more secure, it's, it's more safe, and it's also more clean. Au um, the women have been, again, excluded. They have been marginalized, excluded from society. Um, some women even report that now they feel like in a cage and they are invisible for the society and only accessible for the for the yeah for those who have a car and for the for the clients. Um, and yeah, I come to my conclusion that the media has dominated the construction of spaces in terms of the prostitution and red light district as an identity marker. Um, by producing kind of places of struggle and, and fear and people of fear and yeah that I think it's an often uncritical reporting of prostitution and the actors since it was not that dirty as they reported and it was not as dangerous for the inhabitants of the neighborhood but for the women um, but that was not an issue so much in the, in the media and so it led to an actual geographical shift of the patch and to much more repressive laws on sex work and prostitution. And again, it led to migratory processes, meaning that women would leave Zurich because they found it very difficult to work on the, on the new patch. They had less clients there and, you know, People just walking and cycling, usually in downtown, they would also become a client, but that doesn't happen anymore in the suburbs. But otherwise, as we have realized, improved somehow the working conditions for those who work there. And yeah, the last conclusion was again for the Roma that I think it is frighteningly one sided and it's terrifying the society by denigrating the Roma and marginalizing them once more. So, yeah. thank you for your time. Okay, so please, your questions. I have just one question about this spatial thing. You have this map, and there was this big blue space on the south, because I lived in Zurich in the last three years, mm -hmm. and there's this huge prostitution area around Large Plaza, which I think was marked in the area, but you didn't talk about it. And I was, for me, it was impressive there that the prostitution is so aggressive there. If you are touched and they take you and they kind of grab you, mm -hmm. um, which for me, mm -hmm. the question there is something going, something going on, some pressure or whatever. 
a few. I, no, I think it's this area down there. Yeah, this area down there is rather the. I know, it's the other side too. Down, down, downtown in the city center. Yeah, but still, it's, can you say something about it? Maybe. Well, it is, it is, it is a by the city council official registered uh, red light district. That's true, but but also it like the circuit was very different. It was circuit was purely um, street prostitution, whereas whereas there they they would they would work in their, in their apartments and rooms. So they, that's why they closed the circuit and they did not close that one. There's also other <clears throat> other red light districts within um, the near of the city center and within the, they're very small, just hundred meters long or something. But the seeker was a uh, problem. The problem was the street prostitution that they had no place to exercise the service. Of. So, okay, one more question from Sasha. Can I add into the last question, please? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, uh, can you tell me to which extent exists uh, legislation on prostitution on sex work in Zurich? Because um, the councillor decided something that there is yeah um, ordered um, area where it can be done and so on. There is some signs. There are some rules. You mentioned, for example, they can be washed. Uh, they can be warmed and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, but um, does the state uh, recognize only um, this uh, new right for bigger economic benefits, or is considering, for example, health care or something else? Yeah, I could you maybe group that together with uh, Sasha's question? Just with the, it was so fascinating by the study. Just could you tell us more about the mobility? You said you were traveling with them, and what is this, this aspect? Okay, to your question, um, it's pretty clear. So you can apply to be a sex worker. These days, you have to have an interview with the police first, so they figure out that you have or have not a pimp. If you do not, then you can work for ninety days a year. But you also have to have the European insurance card, which is very easy to take in Hungary, apparently. <laughs> so I was told by, by colleagues in Hungary, social worker. And you have to be, that's the point in Zurich, you can start to prostitute yourself when you're 16 on. Um, I think for foreigners it's 18 still. Um, yeah, these are, the guidelines, and then you have 90 days, you can split them. You can always go and unregister, go home, come back, re register, and once your 90 days are over, that's it. Is that, is that the problem of legislation? Yeah, yeah. Of course, they care for the health, that's why you have to show that you are insured. But on street prostitution, you're not yet paying any, um, any socials. Social contributions or or um, taxes like in Germany. Are they paying tax? Hmm? Are they paying tax? No, that's what I'm saying. On, on the street, okay. on the street, you don't you pay you pay for the permit, but that's like thirty francs or something. Like for these ninety days, you go to the police, you have this interview, they say yes, you can, then you go to a different department, then you pay for the permit. Uh, but you don't pay a tax. These women are not double organized, discriminated, but um, three times because they are women, uh, because they are uh, women and sex workers, they are poor, and they are a larger um, economic benefit from the work. That's exactly what I say in my paper too. They are they're at least three or four times marginalized or discriminated. And to your question, um, okay. the mobility. Um, Yes, that would be a different presentation, but um, there is different patterns for single women with kids, for women without kids, for women with a partner, completely different. Some of them have circular migration patterns, so they would go and work all 90 days in Switzerland, then they go to, to, to Amsterdam, then they go to Berlin, then they would go maybe to, to Strasbourg, and then they come back to Switzerland in the next year. Others would commute every week because they have kids back home. So they would come on the Monday morning, like Monday yeah, morning, arrive at the night train and would go back on Friday. 
yeah, stay the weekend with the kids in, in the northeast of Hungary. So there's, there's very different patterns for different kind of circumstances, I would say. Not personalities, but circumstances of the people. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. Thank